All right, let's get started. Welcome everyone to Making the Most of Flight Simulators. Uh, this is a webinar we're doing sort of to follow up with a, another flight simulator webinar we did early last year. And in this one, we're going to cover some slightly different aspects of using ForeFlight with simulators, especially how you can increase your ForeFlight know-how as a result of uh, simulator usage, as well as just generally improving your flight training and maintaining currency when you aren't able to go out and fly otherwise. Our presenters today are Chris Palmer. Chris is an uh, active CFI in Alaska, and he is the host of Angle of Attack, um, both on, on YouTube and you can visit angleofattack.com to learn more about him. And you can see some of his ratings there. And then from the ForeFly team, we have Martin Kemp. Martin is the Director of Product for Commercial Aviation here at ForeFlight, and he recently obtained his instrument rating. So our topics for today are going to start with looking at the available flight simulators that ForeFlight supports, how you can connect ForeFlight to those flight simulators, and then walking through uh, some basic steps that you can use with ForeFlight and a flight simulator, both from briefing your flight, uh, some of the in-flight capabilities that you can use with both of those, and then reviewing your flight afterwards. And so the goal here is to approach this simulator flight as if it were an actual flight, uh, and as a result, uh, just Im improve your proficiency and improve your ability to plan for and conduct those actual flights. Before we get started, just a couple of notes on the platform we're using. You can ask any questions you have via the GoToWebinar message panel on the right. Um, we encourage you to ask questions at any time during the webinar, whenever they pop into your head. If you ask them earlier, it's more likely you're going to get an answer, uh, whereas if you wait until the very end at the Q&A, uh, a lot of people usually wait until then to submit questions, and so it's less likely that you'll have it answered. We always recommend that you view these webinars from a computer uh, rather than a mobile device. We just find that they tend to uh, perform a little bit better and uh, people tend to run into audio problems when using a mobile device. And lastly, this session is being recorded and it'll be accessible at foreflight.com slash PIC in the next couple days. So with that, I will hand it over to Martin to get us started. Thanks very much for the introduction there, Sam. I'm really excited to be here with Chris uh, talking about uh, ForeFlight with flight simulators. This is uh, a really extremely important part of our flight training and actually maintaining our proficiency uh, in flying as well because you know there are definitely occasions when we can be uh, maybe there's a break in, in our opportunity to go up and fly in real life um, or, for in, or even if the weather for instance is not uh, playing ball with us so we can really keep our, our proficiency um, as we're flying um, you know, using a flight simulator and especially becoming familiar with the systems, um, the system of ForeFlight and the systems within the aircraft as well. Uh, and we can understand how ForeFlight fits in with the flow. We know from many pilots that uh, ForeFlight is, is crucial to their role, not just in terms of, of the navigation content and the charts, but in terms of the pre-flight, uh, in the actual flight itself, and then the, uh, the post-flight aspects of it. And we're going to be covering those today. So one thing that I just wanted to talk about are the flight simulators that are available uh, for use uh, that can connect to ForeFlight. Uh, but in the meantime, Flight Simulator 2020 has actually become available. Um, and so and it's been available for about a year now. And, uh, you know, we, we've definitely seen some uh, fantastic responses to that. And uh, I know that one of the, the aspects that we really enjoy about it is the ability to connect it to uh, ForeFlight um, and to get the live traffic. And so we can talk about uh, the connections here that, that are necessary because uh, for, unlike, say, X-Plane, there isn't a native connection to ForeFlight. Uh, what we need to do is um, we, we need to insert an extra connector, uh, and there are one of these four that can do that. And there's a link that you can follow on the ForeFlight page that will give more details. I know that Chris actually uses the Flight Events uh, connector, so maybe you can give us a quick introduction to that one. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Chris Palmer here. It's um... You know, connecting simulators with ForeFlight is an extremely important process. Obviously, uh, all of us here, we we use and we love ForeFlight. I'm an avid avid user of it. I use it not only personally when I'm flying, but I instruct a lot. I, I love teaching how to use ForeFlight and where and how to use it. So obviously, we would want to connect the ForeFlight world to the simulator world where we're simulating some of these things that Martin is starting to introduce 
And these tools are pretty transparent. I mean, for me, I do use flight events. I was actually a little bit ignorant to these other tools out there, but it they're just very easy to turn on. And then you have four flight right there in the simulator, just as you would naturally use it. So that's the whole idea is bringing that realism into your simulator experience by just using four flight as you usually would in a real airplane. So certainly with the, the flight events connector and the X maps Y ones, um, it doesn't just send the AHAS information. So the position, uh, the attitude of the aircraft, the speed, um, but it actually can send ADSB data as well. And you'll see this in the screen grab up in the top right, uh, where uh, X maps Y runs in a, what's called a GDL 90 mode. Um, and that can send ADSB data. So not only can we see our aircraft, but we can actually see the other aircraft that are present within the application. Um, so Microsoft Flight Simulator, for instance, is able to um, send live traffic. Um, and so, you know, especially if you're in a busy airport environment and flying, um, you know, really practicing uh, to be able to avoid, and say, even if you're using Pilot Edge um, that can provide you with traffic callouts, you're able to see them on four flight, um, understand where they are, um, you know, be able to see them if you're close enough within the flight simulator itself and then make a call. And again, what we're going to show you guys here, like this traffic case, it's amazing to be flying to a busy airport, actually see, you know, a Delta aircraft or something. But we're going to show you so many tools throughout this, um, tools and features really throughout this entire uh, program we have here today that just shows you that realism that you can grab from a simulator. And what I say to my students and anyone kind of looking to use a simulator is, if you can forget for just a few moments that what you're doing is is a simulation, if you think it's real for even those few moments, you've achieved the purpose of a simulator. And uh, and that's exactly what we're trying to do with these these features that just help. And, and traffic, I mean, come on, that's amazing. We can get real world live traffic right now, not only in the simulator, but we can see that traffic in ForeFlight with those tools. There's just, that's awesome. Absolutely. So. One of the things that uh, we wanted to talk about here are, is the briefing aspect of it. Uh, to Chris's point about considering the realism, um, you know, we're not, we don't want to just jump into the simulator and just start flying the plane around and, and not taking real life into it, into account and, and how we would actually perform the flight in order to get a, to get the real benefit from a flight simulator, especially one that when we're working with uh, for flight on it is to go through the briefing aspects of it. Um, and so, what I wanted to do was, was focus on a couple of areas that we didn't cover in the first episode um, to talk here about you know, considerations and especially those that would affect um, instrument the pilots for obstacle departure briefings, um, but then for all pilots for takeoff performance. Um, often we get questions about, well, what's the benefit, for instance, of the performance package that we have within ForeFlight? And so what I want to be able to do is highlight uh, the sheer number of calculations that, can, that you can be saved by using uh, the performance calculations, even in just a, um, say a Piper or a Cessna, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a jet that you're flying in order for takeoff performance to be significant. Um, so let's start off talking about ODPs and um, ob optical departure briefings. Um, so here, for instance, um, I'm looking at the uh, um, ODP for uh, Everett, Washington, Washington which is uh, Painfield, um, which is where uh, Boeing are based. And uh, so in this situation, um, you'll notice uh, down near the bottom right is uh, the obstacle DP aspect of it. And here, depending on which runway we're taking off from, um, it tells us uh, which type of turn that we want to make, uh, which heading we would follow. Um, and then also in critically, um, especially if we're in a, um, an instrument condition uh, environment, it tells us if we haven't made contact uh, by the time we reach a certain altitude, um, you know, where to head from there so that we can avoid the terrain. And we'll actually see that um, as we go into uh, the, the next video, uh, we'll actually start seeing um, the, the impact of the terrain and, and how we need to, how the instrument uh, procedure is going to help us with that. Now, one thing here that I think builds off the last webinar that was done on flight sims is the fact that you can take a simulator very seriously. And so what I really like about what Martin has done here is he's approaching this as if he was doing this himself in a real airplane and taking it, you know, taking it seriously. Because if you're going to fly IFR, you're going to depart from an airport with obstacles, 
obviously you don't want to hit those obstacles. So you would fly something like an ODP and knowing where to go and, and how to get it within four flight. So you can do that in the real, real world is not only what you should be doing in the real world, but it's exactly how you should be flying in the sim as well. Take it seriously, use the tools and, uh, and do it correctly. So Martin, I appreciate that you have started the show, how you can do that with the tools here. We're looking here at the Jefferson presentation of the obstacle departure procedure. And I just want to cover that um, it's not just available as part of Jefferson. The FAA actually published that. Um, if you go to the, uh, the airport in question and then tap on procedure um, and then go to departure, you'll see that there's the takeoff minimums here for pain field. And that actually takes you to the um, chart supplement. And then we need to um, navigate through that to find pain field. Um, so this is one of the great things about Jefferson uh, to be able to find this out. And I, I really enjoy the way that Jeppesen is presented. I just feel like they break down everything better because obviously the FAA only provides this in textual format. An ODP isn't visual like a SID. Uh, and, and so they actually break it down kind of line by line what you're looking for. And that's really helpful as a pilot when you're trying to depart an airport that you're unfamiliar with, haven't flown that ODP before. You know, anything that can help you just fly it well and understand how you're flying it. Uh, it, it, you know, design goes a long way and Jeppesen does a good job at doing that. So now what we're going to do is have a look at the video of, of the use of this, uh, the departure notes. Um, so for instance, here, um, we, we've actually switched to the departure chart, um, that Chris just referenced. Um, and so this gives us a graphical representation of the departure, uh, from this air, airfield. And as you can see with all the oranges, um, there's a lot of terrain nearby. So if we were going to depart from runway 16 left, um, it tells us that we would climb on heading 164. Um, and, uh, the top altitude would be assigned by ATC. I actually changed the uh, thickness of the pen so I can actually write this down. They gave us 4,000 feet that we're going to climb to, uh, which is great. Um, and so we would basically stay on that, that heading until we, uh, reached, uh, 4,000 feet. Um, but you'll notice there's a section up um, in the top right that actually covers the uh, the lost comms, and we'll we'll come on to that now. Um, where as we're departing, um, you know, if we are not in contact with approach by the time we reach two thousand feet, then we would continue that climb um, to to four thousand feet. But critically, we would turn back to the pain VOR, which is directly over the top of the airfield. So again, the approach is taking the departure rather is taking into account. Uh, the fact that there's a terrain nearby and they don't want you to continue climbing uh, potentially into the mountains. Um, and so we're going to turn back um, onto the, uh, uh, to head back to the VOR. And so, uh, you know, I've drawn out the departure um, heading that we would follow and then decided that I'm going to do a left turn um, and then come back to uh, the VOR. And can I just say that uh, this is probably the primary reason why I'm such a, a large proponent of four flight um, is IFR pilots, as you guys are seeing here, whether you're reminding yourself of what it's like to go through these procedures or whether you're in training, uh, ForeFlight is such a fantastic aggregator of information. And then like the tools that Martin is using here to simply highlight the one section that he's going to use and the data once again, that is the most important for this part of the, of the procedure is just one of those things that, you know, in today's world, we may manage so much data. There's so much going on to be able to zone in on what matters when is super important. And, and for flight just does such a good job at that across the board, but you're seeing it here in a fantastic example with this SID. So one of the other aspects to take into account is we talked about how to depart from this airfield, but you know, we're in the Pacific Northwest, we're coming into winter, there's the opportunity that the weather forecast may actually uh, not be as, as uh, bad as, as the weather we encounter. So this is an opportunity for us to use this, uh, the new uh, flight binders that we have on the left-hand side, especially highlighting the ability to highlight the approach for, um, to the airport that we just left. So we get up, you know, things are not as, as good as we thought they would be, and we decide that we're gonna go back to base before we make it any worse. And I, I really love this binder feature. When it came out, I, I was very excited. This is one thing I teach my students, uh, my IFR students very early on, how to organize their flights, have all the information right here. Because when, like in this case, say that you did have to return to the field or, or had some sort of uh, alternate you had to fly or you had to execute a different plan than originally planned, you can come to this binder quickly 
and it's right there and it, it's just so nice you don't have to hunt and and find it so uh very helpful so for those of you that are are flying ifr definitely start using the binder mm -hmm. And, you know, as we see here, this, to Chris's point, this is something that we can build up as part of our initial briefing of, you know, what approaches, what's the weather at the moment, what approach is it likely to be that we'll come back to. And then as we get to our destination airport, we can actually um, put those in as well. Um, and so this was actually inspired by uh, Mobile Flight Deck um, and uh, Flight Deck Pro, um, but with some, some modifications to be able to, for instance, have uh, both airports visible at the same time uh, so that we can quickly switch between the, the charts of those uh, without having to change the airport. Um, and so, you know, as you can see here, I've um, one of one is the, I'm viewing one of the approaches that I had selected. And then for our destination airport, I have an approach selected and I have an airport selected as well. And by the way, if you plan a flight, just say you plan it graphically in map view and have a, an origin and a destination, you can import it in here and it already knows what your departure and arrival airports are. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So it, it's, uh, this really helps with the smoothness of the transition between the charts. Okay. So what we wanted to do now was talk about uh, the performance. Um, part of this is uh, really to help to kind of um, show folks why the performance plan is uh, really important um, and, and really useful as part of ForeFlight, uh, not just for jet pilots. Um, as you can see here, we have uh, quick links to the takeoff and landing performance. So on here, we're on the flights tab uh, with the flight selected, and we have a departure of uh, Payne Field and our destination um, is, of Whidbey Island is um, in there as well. And you'll notice that there are these extra buttons of takeoff and landing uh, next to those uh, airfields. Um, and so we, when we tap on that, um, it will actually be able to give us uh, the calculated performance based on the prevailing weather conditions um, and the state of our aircraft. So taking the weight and balance into account, for instance. And you'll notice here that just underneath the uh, departure and destination area, um, here's the selected aircraft that I had. Uh, this is actually the Warrior that I fly. Um, so I have a performance profile that I'm able to choose, one from many um, that are actually defined in the POH. So this is all taking POH data um, and, but then able to calculate it, all of the, uh, the charts that we see in the POH have been um, codified uh, so that the calculations can be made as it would be uh, as if you did it from the, uh, the POH. Um, so now let's get into what it would look like if we were to tap on the, the takeoff view. Uh, we're brought to this page where we can see all of the blue text that is editable. Uh, it's automatically filled in because it takes the METAR conditions uh, for that particular airport for the chosen runway um, and enters that into the weather. Um, and uh, the aircraft, aircraft configuration is taken from our weight and balance, uh, takeoff flaps are what are default from the POH. And you can see the safety distance factor that we can enter so that we can increase that. So for instance, if we want to uh, like add an extra 50%, we could just enter 1.5 here and all of the calculations would, would be uh, given that extra safety factor. We all know that the POH factor uh, was when the airplane was brand new, uh, when the, the, the test pilot landed right on the numbers, um, you know, and apply the brakes immediately. We don't necessarily all make it that way. So let's add a safety factor and, and give us some room there. So now what we can do is we can go to the landing view and we'll see that it's basically the same um, and we'll see the calculated values um, that, that we dis are displayed according to our current conditions and the safety factor. In this case, we're choosing a, a runway. And so now we can uh, view down and see the gray areas, which are the calculated values. And we notice that the landing flaps is fixed at 40 degrees there. Um, and so we get our um, landing distance and our, our roll from there. So now we've done the calculation, we can now switch to the taxi diagram because we're ready to taxi um, and move on. So now we've taken off and we're in flight. Let's talk about some of the aspects that a flight simulator can be, can be beneficial for us uh, while we're in flight. Uh, these are, you know, unsurprisingly, the, the most common elements, um, but there are some changes that have happened rec recently, especially with Microsoft Flight Simulator coming out, can really help us in terms of the VFR flying. Um, the visualization, the uh, accuracy using the Bing maps uh, just means that VFR flight has taken a whole new level from before. So I've lined up four videos that we can uh, use as examples of the, of the visualization. Uh, this one actually is in uh, Denver, Colorado, um, at Centennial Airport. Um, and so you can see the airport um, up on the left-hand side here. 
Um, and there's actually a road just across from a, um, a hill at the side of it. Um, and that's where the, the Jefferson office is. So we're actually flying along the, uh, the road that leads up to the Jefferson office. And you'll see just how close that office is to the uh, Centennial Airport. Often when uh, aircraft are landing, um, uh, especially the jets, you can, you can really hear them when you're at the office. And I've actually flown in there before. So that definitely looks like the real thing. It's just incredible, the, the realism that's come out of the uh, application from that perspective. Uh, so on the left hand side right now is the, uh, we're just coming up to the, the Jefferson office. Um, as you can see, there's a big uh, car park and, and expands a, a fair way across uh, with a magnificent entrance hall there. So now let's switch to uh, ForeFlight. We're going to see the, the ForeFlight office uh, in Austin. And uh, we're, we're heading west on uh, 6th Street towards downtown. And uh, again, from a VFR perspective, this is incredible. And I've done this flight before actually myself uh, with a friend of mine in Austin at nighttime. So, it, I mean, even me not being from there, I've actually seen this before. And I, even the, the little bit that I've been there, it's familiar to me. That's fantastic. Uh, I like to take uh, new uh, passengers up with me. And uh, I'll often we'll do a, a, a like a virtual city tour beforehand so that they, they can get an idea about what it will look like, um, especially if they're a bit nervous about flying um, so that they get an idea about what they'll be able to see. And it really helps to inspire the excitement. Um, and then sometimes when they're really gung ho about just going flying, then we'll do that. And then we'll be able to watch it virtually afterwards and say, oh, that's the such and such building as we're going. Um, so once again, the but from a VFR perspective, this is just in incredible to be able to understand it. And we, one of the things that's uh, really great for it is practice for a long cross country, for instance, uh, flying an unfamiliar route, uh, be that unfamiliar territory um, or terrain, um, or even just getting a handle on where the air airfield is. And that's really important to me as an instructor, because if there's a student that's apprehensive about doing their first solo cross country or their long cross country, or I know that there are a lot of people that are even apprehensive after they get their license, maybe flying a, a you know a very long distance somewhere that they're they're not used to flying into or into a different state or into a place with more terrain. Lots of different examples we could use, but that allows you to actually go there and see it before you do it in the real world. Uh, you know, if you want that extra source of assurance that you've done things correctly and literally you could use only the sectional chart to navigate and it would be perfect. Even if you're in a rural, rural area, I mean, obviously Austin downtown, you can see the big buildings, but you could literally follow a river and follow it on the map. It could say there's a little cabin on that river. You could see the cabin. Uh, so this new simulator, this Microsoft Flight Sim 2020, which by the way, was just released on Xbox as well, uh, is just amazing from a VS VFR perspective. Absolutely. So it's often said that the first thing folks do when they get into the Microsoft Flight Simulator is go and fly over their house. Um, so I didn't fly over my actual house. Um, what I flew over was where I grew up um, in England. And what this really highlighted to me was just the how the terrain can look so different, not terrain so much, but the, the uh, local environment. And we can see the fields off in the right hand side as a uh, um, there's a wind farm or a, a, a wind generator there that uh, wasn't there when I used to live there. It helped to show the scale as well because I'm doing the same airspeed and ground speed as I was um, in America. Um, and yet I seem to be whizzing over the ground here um, in England and uh, it really highlighted the, the difference in scale. You'll see also uh, up in the top left, there's a visual reporting point. Um, and so to Chris's point about being able to use a sectional here, um, you know, there's much more use of uh, um, VD, visual reporting points, um, you know, as you're flying around. Um, and so I was able to see, okay, what would that look like as I come towards there? When would I be ready to report it? Um, and we can see my uh, breadcrumbs that I was kind of circling around the area just to try and get different views um, as I view uh, uh, fly in uh, different directions. Obviously, there are so many different examples of how you could use a simulator like uh, like you have here, Martin, with showing the realism. But again, me going back to what I was talking about before, you can use a simulator to fly somewhere that you're uncomfortable or, or test something new and different out. So uh, obviously here in Alaska, this is a place a lot of people want to fly. They, they would enjoy flying here. It's kind of a bucket list place to come. 
And so a lot of the times when I uh, fly with friends or with customers that are just visiting, we end up flying in some pretty extreme places, you could call it, with towering mountains. One place that I really enjoy going to with, uh, it's kind of a special experience, more so with friends, is Denali National Park. So that's where one of the largest mountains is in North America, uh, Denali. And you can fly up the Ruth Glacier there, which is, you know, I think it's a 20 mile long glacier. And just the scale of that is totally different. Of course, there's nothing like doing it in the real world, but even doing it in the simulator is, is just an amazing experience. So if you've never flown in mountains before, for example, this could be a wonderful opportunity opportunity for you in a simulator to fly in the mountains. That's a pretty extreme example. There are lots of mountains in Alaska. Another great example is Soldovia, which is just south of where I am here in Homer, Alaska. And that is a, a, a tight little airstrip. It's got um, trees all around it. It's got a, a nice little authentic Alaskan village there. You can only get there by airplane or by boat. Um, beautiful place to walk around, but the simulator environment is is almost exactly like the real thing. And it's just really neat to see. And if you want to uh, really test your skills, two airports down the road, Nanawalik, it's built on a beach and it's a turning runway. So it's a, a legal state runway, but you can land on the, uh, the runway there that's actually on a beach. Very challenging terrain around a town. So those are maybe some more extreme maybe even some fun examples of how to use a simulator to test or improve your skills. Well, given the videos we just saw, they look absolutely amazing. And uh, I really look forward to being able to get up there and, and uh, do a discovery flight with you. And so you can show me what that looks like in real life. That would, that would be incredible. Come on up. So with the places that I've lived personally um, as, a, as a pilot, I, and we're talking real world now, not in the, the beautiful simulator world where we can zip back and forth. But I grew up in, in Utah, had a lot of uh, flying experience there. That's where I got my uh, instrument rating and flew all, all around the West with that instrument rating, even to the East a little bit. Um, and then obviously now Alaska. So icing is something that I have dealt with almost my entire career as a pilot, my entire time as a pilot. Um, and I haven't necessarily been flying in airplanes that are are FICI certified, flight in the known icing. In other words, my job has been to avoid ice. And so we're going to talk about a few tools here now with the simulator that you can use, kind of experimenting with that. I know that Martin had his own experience in the simulator, having not experienced icing in real life. But we also wanted to point out some of the features within ForeFlight that can help you uh, help you with icing information. So one of the tools that I have always used, you would find within the imagery tab of ForeFlight. There you can go to the, the icing section and you can find not only the max icing potential, but you can look at different altitudes and what the icing will be at those different altitudes. You can start to build kind of a picture within your own mind of what that will be. Now, if that wasn't enough to have all that amazing data free from uh, the government, ForeFlight has come up with a way to actually put that in the simulator. So not only can you see it in the profile view, but you can also see it in the 3D view now. Uh, from what I understand, that's a performance plus feature where you can actually visualize where that icing is. So very, very helpful because when I first did my training, this was uh, before four flight. So this would have been, gosh, uh, circa 2006 or seven, somewhere in there. So, you know, right before four flight was founded, I was doing my instrument training and ran across with my instructor. We ran across, I would call it moderate to severe icing in Southern Idaho. And turns out that we ended up building an inch and three quarters of ice on the airplane. It was a bonanza. It was not a good situation. Um, my instructor, first of all, who will be uh, unnamed for his protection, just wasn't from this area, didn't really know what he was getting into. All of this, these tools could have helped. Um, kind of became an emergency situation, but we didn't necessarily declare an emergency, but we got out of it. So the seriousness of icing for me was 
was drilled into me from a very young pilot age where I realized I have to take this, take this seriously. I have to avoid this stuff. And so that's where the, the tools started to come up. And uh, I know that you had a, a similar harrowing experience, but in the simulator, Martin, so do you want to share about that? Um, and this really highlighted what we mentioned earlier on about when something really feels real, um, even though I'm sitting there safe at home. Uh, so in my situation, I was actually, again, up in the Pacific Northwest. We're really hammering them hard this time. Um, so I was up at about 7,000 feet and I, I'd seen the forecast I knew that there was a, a risk of icing up there, um, but uh, it was about the, the highest that I was willing to go before I was definitely going to experience icing. Um, I was flying with Pilot Edge, so I was actually under an IFR flight plan in communication with ATC, and I was even just trying to climb up to that altitude, and I, I just was unable, um, and I had to declare that. And it was actually good practice from a, a, a communications perspective of being able to you know, declare um, a an urgent situation. I didn't declare it as an emergency at the time because I knew there was warmer air below me, but I had to make use of the uh, MSA, the minimum safe altitude during the flight to actually be able to determine what could I drop down to. And in communication with uh, ATC, you know, for them to know, uh, you know, the best uh, uh, headings for me to take and altitude to work to so that I would be safe and uh, not at risk of hitting the terrain. Um, and so, you know, from a perspective of preparation for understanding it you know i'd gone through the pre-flight i had an idea but i just wanted to experience what it was what, what, what could happen to me and how could i deal with it in communication um you know it, it, i tried to follow the ava navigate communicate and uh and uh, making use of the, the the full range of resources i really came away from there sweating bullets going wow if i was in that in real life then um you know i i really would want to be as prepared as i could be for it in hindsight, now that it's been a handful of years since that happened to me, I definitely would have declared an emergency. So I think to your point, using the tools available, uh, you know, make sure that you use all the tools and there's more that legally uh, controllers can do when you declare an emergency to get you out of situations like that. So there's a, I want to mention a couple of resources and because this kind of dovetails well, I'm first going to mention the AOPA uh, Air Safety Institute video that was done recently about some icing incidents. And it was a scenario where, uh, spoiler, spoiler alert, the pilot flying was not communicating well enough how dire the situation was and wasn't getting enough help for what they needed. Despite the pilot's assurances, the Bonanza's descent continues. It's now a 2,200 feet MSL, only 1,000 feet AGL. Well, four o'clock, how you doing, sir? Ah, uh, we're doing okay right now. Waiting for the sites to dissipate. Um, didn't end well. Uh, I'll kind of leave it there, but definitely go check out that video because it's very instructive on how serious icing is. Uh, and Air Safety Institute always does a great job illustrating that. One tool that um, many of you can use freely is NASA. So the NASA we know for sending people to the moon. Um, they also do a lot of testing for certain things. They've done a lot of icing testing. So they have figured out a bunch of the reasons why and where and how icing forms. And it's not what you really think. And it's not as pervasive as you would think. Uh, I would kind of lead with on that. But that's all available for free online is that NASA icing course. I just found that very helpful for me as I was learning more and more about it because I was flying around it so much. So definitely those two resources, the AOPA Air Safety Institute and the, the NASA icing course is very helpful. And one final uh, tool within ForeFlight that I would mention is the, uh, the icing layer that exists um, when you're using ForeFlight so that you can actually view at different altitudes uh, on the map you know, with the sectional in place as well. Uh, so you can get an idea of the severity as forecast there. So, you know, we're talking about the imagery, the icing layer, um, at the, at the um, performance level, uh, you have the 3D clouds and the preview view. And one other thing I use just as a, another kind of step up, because actually here in Alaska, we don't have the same imagery and icing information that you do in the lower 48. We don't have the same granularity. So what I do is I go to the wind view. So if you go to the weather section, just for your particular airport, you look at your winds aloft, 
I look at the freezing level and where that is at for my particular airport, just so I'm aware. It doesn't necessarily mean there's ice there, but if I'm going to be flying in the clouds, I want to know where that's at. And then from there, I can build some, let's call them egress plans. So that if I need to descend to a lower altitude or get a vector somewhere, I kind of have a plan already in my mind what I would ask ATC. So we talked about the VFR elements and the visuals of, of working with a flight simulator and, you know, the, the ability to be able to recognize the landmarks as we're flying through and just get an idea about just how beautiful uh, this country and the rest of the world is um, and our ability to be able to navigate that using ForeFlight as well. So let's move on to IFR, which is quite the opposite. Uh, you know, we're, most of the time when we're doing our IFR practice, we're not allowed to look outside. I have to say, when I got my IFR a certificate, I was very pleased to be able to take off those bubbles and actually be able to look outside and even just admire the clouds because, uh, you know, there's, uh, there is such a thing as a wonderful cloud to look at and I've got many photos to prove it. However, when we're doing our IFR training, most of the time is about focusing on the instruments. You know, the, the, the watch phrase in all of this is trust your instruments. And that's great when the instruments are working. Uh, but we also know that one of the other parts that comes into uh, when we're flying the IFR is the fact that the instruments or one of them um, might lie to us. Um, and so we need to learn partial panel practice as well. Um, and this is one of the really great elements of working with a simulator is that we can put ourselves in those situations um, and we can work with uh, ForeFlight, um, helping us, giving us the situational awareness um, so that we can determine, are we correctly interpreting the instruments? So using failures is something that a simulator is really good at. Obviously, there are things you wouldn't want to fail on an airplane in the real world. For example, your engine, um, that's kind of an extreme case. But you can also drill down to specific instruments or say, in this particular case, you want to fail the vacuum system so you can see what that's like, or you want to do some sort of pedostatic blockage. You can emulate all of those things within the simulator, something that x-plane in this particular case which is what i use for uh most of my ifr work in a sim is really good at and you can set things on random failures uh tell them how often you want them to happen but i think in this case it's good to just cue that up and see what it looks like see those things degrade and then like you said you you trust the uh the instruments right but you can work on that process of trust but verify and the verify process is actually check between your different uh, instrument systems and make sure that they are operating correctly. So that's definitely part of it too. But yep, the, the, the failures part of this is definitely something that we haven't even mentioned yet, but it's this whole other level of a simulator that is so immersive. So when I was going through my instrument training, one thing that I did, especially as I was getting later in the process, um, I really wanted to be able to kind of sharpen the sword. I, you know, I'd learned the basics of it and partial panel was something that I was having trouble with. Um, you know, the uh, instructor would cover up a, um, an instrument that I'd been focused on and suddenly I was having to look at others. And so I really needed to, to work hard on being able to cover up any one of them at any time and then be able to interpret the situation. Um, so I actually just had it so that my whole screen was covered with the panel and then I would use a post-it to cover it up. Say for instance, the heading indicator or the HSI or attitude indicator. And then, you know, that forced me to rely on the others um, knowing that if I needed to take a quick peek, I could, but you know, I, that was really just for verification. But the important thing was that I really tried to treat it as a real life situation. Um, that my in my instruments were not working. I literally couldn't look at anything else. I had to rely on those instruments and interpret all of what they were telling me um, as I went through. Um, and, I, and so over a, a period of um, about a week, um, I was doing that. Um, it was, it, of course, you know, four flights very busy, um, have a family, finding time to be able to do that was, uh, was often problematic. And so being able to sit down for an hour, two hours, um, just focusing on, on that situation with the post-its uh, covering up those particular areas, um, there was one particular VOR approach that was just killing me. And, uh, and so, you know, I had a lesson, I think on the Friday, had a week of practice on the sim and then came back the following Monday. Um, and I just nailed it. And uh, it really highlighted to me that ability to be able to do it. Um, because I, you know, was taking off very quickly from an airfield straight into other airspace, then having to get ready for the VOR approach, having to get the weather, get the briefing. And then suddenly my, um, and my instructor would just fail one of the instruments. And I was like, Really? <laughs> but that's <laughs> what can happen, you know? So uh, it was very important from that perspective. And 
again, another example of using the simulator in a realistic way. I really like Martin that you, you actually use post-it notes on your screen. I think that's just a fantastic idea to do. And so many different scenarios, right? I, I love your personal experience there of, of using the simulator. Uh, I had a recent student I soloed. So this is more of a VFR example, but he was having trouble with setting up the airplane in the pattern and some of the landings, but he would go back and fly Microsoft 2020 and was doing fantastic. He would come back and just be, you know, probably two lessons ahead of where he would have been just by being able to practice that. Um, of course, what we're talking about here is IFR and that gets even more procedural and you can get behind the airplane quickly. And then when someone throws an, a failure on you on top of that, then you really know if you're ahead of the airplane or not. So, um, you know, what we're trying, what we're kind of uncovering here, uh, if I may say, is the value of having a simulator at home where you can practice these procedures and stay proficient. And, and it's right there at your fingertips. The cost of entry isn't very high. You already have four flight. You can use that and, uh, and stay on top of your, uh, your instrument chops in this particular case. Absolutely. So one of the things that I wanted to cover with the, this video is going into the um, ability to find somewhere to go and practice for IFR. Um, one of the reasons that this is important is because these flight simulators are able to download real world weather. And of course, ForeFlight only knows about real, real world weather. Um, it doesn't speak to the uh, simulator from that perspective. So here, what I'm doing is I actually just turned on the SIGMET layer and looked for IFR. So you can see that I just turned on the IFR layer. And unsurprisingly, up in the Pacific Northwest, there's an IFR going on there right now. So what I was able to do was turn on um, the flight category and then look at the, the airports that are experiencing uh, some poor weather right now. Um, and so I, I could choose one and uh, Painfield, you know, we talked about the ODP from that earlier on. So we already know that uh, there is, you know, definitely work that would have to be done from an obstacle uh, uh, departure procedure to be able to deal with that. So I'm going to use that as my uh, takeoff um, airfield um, and try and follow the procedure that we talked about. Um, but then what I did is I... Um, I zoomed in, I zoomed out rather to find another um, airfield that had a, an interesting approach. And in this case, I was able to find a um, a naval base uh, that I wouldn't normally be able to fly into. That's right on the ca the Canadian uh, border. And you can see how I was also looking at the weather in those situations, and so I was able to look for you know when the um, the clouds you know few one thousand broken twenty three hundred. And it's one of the first times that you're going to look for bad weather, right? So that's what you're trying to do is actually find the bad stuff so you can practice in it. Right, exactly. Um, you know, most of the time uh, I, I'm looking to for the weather to be good. But uh, yeah, certainly uh, in that situation, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking for something that is, is going to be challenging for me. Um, and so I was able to use the profile view here, which is a feature of Performance Plus and Pro Plus. Um, to be able to see, you know, the forecast clouds and, of course, understand the airspace as well. So going up to uh, the Whidbey Island uh, naval base, um, I can see that, you know, we're going into uh, a Charlie and, uh, um, you know, with some clouds forecast there um, around our cruise altitude. So now we've chosen the airports that we're going to fly to. Uh, let's have a look at the approach into uh, Whidbey Field. And so we can see here that, um, firstly, the the approach is not directly straight in. There's a, a slight angle to it. Um, and also, even though there's a hole depicted at AUKUS, um, when I inserted this into the GPS, it didn't actually highlight that as the as a procedure turn. Um, it just said that I can turn straight into AUKUS when coming up from uh, Painfield. And there's no mention um, of uh, no procedure turn in there. Um, but uh, the critical thing is, before I even um, I, I'm flying this approach, I'm going to start briefing it. And I'm going to start using the markup tools that exists within Four Flight to be able to do this. And I, I really like uh, this idea of highlighting things within your approach chart. And just as an example, you didn't highlight the frequencies. That's not the most important thing. That kind of takes care of itself in the background. You're hi highlighting the most important data as you go along and brief that approach. And uh, you know, this is something I teach my students from the very first time we look at a chart is how to annotate your charts with four flight so that your eyes can quickly be drawn to that section. Exactly. So here, for instance, I chose the, the final approach course 
Um, the name of the final fix and the altitude that I would be at at, at the final approach fix. Um, and I've also highlighted a couple of things like um, to, for the missed approach, um, you know, which way I'll be turning in the, to get into the hold. Um, and then also because this is an MDA, um, the altitude that I'll be leveling off at, um, you know, in order to be able to see the, the airfield rather than uh, needing to go miss straight away. Um, and, and so you can see lower down, I also highlighted the, uh, the minimums um, for the altitude and for the weather. And we can see that it's only th uh, three, nine, five feet above the uh, elevation. And so um, uh, the airfield is very low near, ground, uh, near um, sea level. So now we've briefed the approach and we're um, en route. And we're just uh, in this situation, uh, just coming up to the turn uh, to come inbound uh, from the initial approach fix. Um, and you can see in this situation that I'm actually uh, flying, you know, just at, at the cloud level. Um, it's not complete. Um, I don't. I have some level of reference to the horizon, but uh, you know, as we know, sometimes the clouds can be at an angle, and so it's not something to rely on. Um, but in this situation, I'm, you know, I, I have the uh, instruments visible. I'm in IMC, and so I could cover those up with a post-it. And what you can see here as well is that on four flight, you can see the annotations that were already made. They are on the map view. They are geo-referenced, so you see your own ship over top. But you can also see that Martin selected the approach path through the procedure section. So he's also got altitude reminders stepping down and even his final approach fix or his his minimum descent altitude in magenta there at the end. So tool upon tool, reminder upon reminder that help you stay situationally aware. Absolutely. Um, and you'll notice I have the, the breadcrumbs on so that I can track how well I'm doing uh, with the uh, the path as well. Um, and especially from a perspective of, of initially getting used to, um, you know, flying approaches or, uh, you know, flying between waypoints, um, it helps to ascertain, you know, am I maintaining the, the course that I should be uh, taking into account, for instance, the, uh, the wind corrections that I might need to make during the, the route. We were uh, joking around a little bit beforehand that uh, Martin being the slightly experienced instrument pilot he is now, I, I don't want to give you too much credit because you need to stay proficient in your sim. Uh, the difference between Martin, who can fly that beautiful straight breadcrumb line, and my students who are weaving down, <laughs> you know, trying <laughs> to hold a line, there's a little bit of a difference there. So that always teaches you something. Those breadcrumbs are actually very useful for a debrief. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I think that that's a, a really important point to consider in that is that uh, um, in being able to see how much variation is going on and being able to understand how to interpret the instruments, you know, especially... Like for instance, going from the on route mode down to terminal mode, then down to final approach, um, understanding uh, you know the difference that um, on the deviation from center line to the one dot, two dot, three dot um, is is quite incredible from that perspective. I think it's also very encouraging for a pilot to see where they started, to see that they were. Um, I'm talking breadcrumbs again. See where they started, that they were kind of weaving back and forth. And then when they nail it, when they fly on rails, as I say it, which I think is a common term amongst instructors, when they can fly it on rails, you go and you show them and prove to them, hey, you flew perfect on that approach path and did a great job. So in a way, it's also a confidence booster. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, if you look at some of my early track logs versus uh, how this one was looking, then uh, yeah, they're quite different. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> um, this Here's another example of the... Uh, being able to have the simulator set up as it is in your aircraft. I'm fortunate enough to have a GTN series uh, um, navigator. Um, and so I was able to have that screen up when I was working. Um, so, you know, I have um, ForeFlight there able to give me the situational awareness. But for instance, say, you know, I lose my heading indicator, um, you know, the, the default is to use the track. So I've got my desired track in there. And then I can make sure that I'm actually following that track as I'm flying. So I have my um, sort of navigation inputs for uh, how far off course I am, but then also being able to see, you know, and follow the track. And this brings up a, a good point that um, ForeFlight is not to be used as a primary navigation tool in IFR. It's uh, it's situational awareness, it's uh, data management, you know, many of the things that we've mentioned. And that's a really good point that you just made, Martin, because uh, explain here with your particular GPS that you use is very helpful. You know, you can use legally some of the tools there whereas for flight is all the other stuff maintaining aware and i can't tell you how many times um for flight saved the day for a student 
when, you know, their head gets in a whirl and they've been turning this way and that way in IFR. And then, you know, they look at their four flights like, oh, that's where I am. So definitely they work hand in hand. I just wanted to mention the legality of that. So people understood that you do need to be flying primarily on the instruments that are meant for that particular approach. So that covers the uh, in-flight part and uh, a great addition to our first episode of in-flight usage of uh, the simulator and for flight. So now let's talk about the post-flight part of it. We've mentioned breadcrumbs already, and uh, I can't stress how useful they are, uh, whether you're using them in flight or uh, especially if you have an instructor sat next to you who's able to follow the breadcrumbs um, so that you can fly as best you think you are. Um, and uh, and then the, the instructor can follow it. And, and as Chris mentioned, being able to refer back to it later and just say, OK, well, you know, that time when, uh, say, for instance, the winds were changing um, or, you know, you were changing heading, you know, the impact that it has um, on your route of flight from there, being able to overlay that with the magenta line as well, uh, enormously useful from that perspective. So the breadcrumbs, uh, you know, give you like that live view, uh, which is just uh, from over um, like the lateral view. Um, but the other one is the track log. Uh, you know, we know that it's possible to track our logs. So they record uh, position, um, altitude, speed, heading, um, the AHARS information as well, if it's available. Um, and um, as we mentioned, that can come through from the simulator um, so that we can review that later so that we can see uh, with much greater granularity, the route that we followed, uh, we can see what altitude we were at, what speeds we were at, um, and the even the attitude of the aircraft as well, so that we can understand were we overbanking, for instance, were we, um, you know, uh, causing a stall by pulling back too far. Um, this has been enormously useful for me, um, coming to the point about you going through my training and maintaining currency, being able to see, you know, those lines getting straighter and straighter rather than sort of, you know, um, going up and down. Um, to, you know, to highlight my, for instance, um, stable approaches, um, being able to see that my approach speeds are correct, um, you know, according to the uh, the prevailing weather. Um, so, you know, that that's one great use of, of track log. Yeah, you can really see those after a flight and, and kind of what we talked about with the bread comes, you know, joking around about seeing that, that weave, that line that a student will keep. Once you have a student that's really keeping to those altitudes, you'll see these really nice step downs in the profile view of the track log that shows that they're stepping down well, they're leveling off well, they're keeping that altitude. And it it's kind of like the beauty of data. You know, you see this these beautiful curves in this case and sometimes beautiful straight lines. So that's what we're looking for in the track log. Ends up becoming not only a great self debrief tool, but also a great debrief tool in a training environment. Mm -hmm. I, I, there's one track log I particularly um, like looking at uh, fairly early in my instrument training. Uh, we were focusing on being able to climb and descend um, at very specific speeds um, and, you know, kind of even regardless of turns, being able to do that. And so I have this very clear sawtooth uh, track log uh, that shows, you know, the climb up 500 feet down, 500 feet up and down. Um, and, you know, it, it was really amazing how you could look at just a couple of lessons prior to that, how I was all over the place. And, you know, yes, technically I got to that altitude, but the way I got to it wasn't great. Um, and especially being able to then see the difference, it, being able to do it at different speeds as well, and really learning the control of the aircraft uh, was beneficial from that perspective. Yeah, that ends up, you know, all of this, honestly, with IFR, with managing all of this, with seeing data like that, with seeing the result of your skill, um, in, in a data-driven way like that, it ends up becoming this, you know, this kind of fun, nerdy side of becoming an IFR pilot that I don't think a lot of people consider. There is a lot of joy to be had in flying the numbers and seeing how that turns out. And, and it just kind of gives you that little extra confidence as a pilot that, hey, I've got some of the right stuff for sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So one of the other aspects that I wanted to talk about is what we can and can't log from a simulator time perspective. Uh, for instance, um, the simulators that we use at home are not uh, certified. Um, and so therefore, you know, we're not able to record those for currency, um, but we can, as we've discussed, we can definitely use them for building up proficiency. Um, so one thing that I actually do with my logbook um, is I was able to create a custom field within my logbook um, that I just call X-Plane. Um, and so whenever I record a track log, 
um, I'll zero out all the other fields, but I'll put the, to the, the flight time in as my X-plane time. Um, and so that way, firstly, I can record, you know, how much time I'm spending, you know, using the home simulator versus say a, um, a BATD um, or even in the real aircraft. But secondly, I'm able to quickly find those um, entries in there. Um, so when I do a search, uh, so that I can actually then review that and compare, you know, for instance, if I'm like preparing for a cross country flight, I can practice that in the simulator, then compare that to a real flight when I, when I do it later on. And, you know, how well did it compare? Uh, did I fly the same kind of routes? You know, were there differences from that perspective? Uh, so Chris, maybe you could give us uh, some detail on uh, what we can log and can't log from uh, the ATD perspective. Yeah, so there there are two different types of simulators that you can log from. The first is a BATD and an AATD. Uh, at the very simple level, it stands for basic and advanced. A basic device, you can log 10 hours toward your instrument rating. And uh, an advanced device, you can log 20 hours toward your instrument rating. What's crazy about that is for your instrument rating, you technically only need 15 hours of training with an instructor. So they're allowing you to use even more than that to log it legally in your logbook as IFR time. Um, I, I've been around the block a few times. I, in kind of this millennial generation that grew up with the home PC, I've been flying simulators since I was a kid, uh, with, you know, mostly for fun at first, but I mean, I got, I got really nerded out as a teenager and I was flying airliners with actual IFR procedures, you know, so I've been there, I've seen some stuff. You know, Chris has seen some stuff in his day, but simulators have come so far and now to use them in a real and a practical way toward helping us maintain that safety that is so important for aviation. And I call it the golden rule. My golden rule is I return home safe to my family every time. And that, that kind of lays the baseline on what I have to do in aviation, the types of decisions I have to make. So a simulator at home apart from the stuff I just mentioned that you can log is an incredible proficiency tool to stay on top of those procedures, the speed at which things happen, the unknowns that could happen, the types of weather that maybe you've never seen or, or flown in before. Uh, but you know, you want to actually see the clouds out the window rather than just looking at your foggles or see what it's like to break out of an approach right at minimums and see how big that runway looks right in front of you. Those are all things that are just incredibly helpful with the simulator, helps you stay ahead of it um, and stay proficient. Uh, one other thing to mention on top of that is that continuing education, continuing um, requirements to keep your instrument rating both current and, and proficient, I guess, too, is you can use a simulator for that uh, recency of experience that you're required to have the six hits, you know, the six approaches, holds, intercepting courses, all that sort of thing. Um, you can use a simulator for that. So say that you're in a situation where you got your instrument rating, or maybe you own an airplane now and, and it's not instrument, uh, certified, you can still go to a simulator, keep up on that and log it legally as you move on to keep that that legal requirement for you to have that recency of experience. So all those things are very helpful. And Martin, I just want to say again, great job using a, a practical tool to log that unloggable simulator time in your logbook. I think that's a really clever way to use that custom field section in the four flight logbook. Great. Thank you. One thing that I also wanted to mention, we've covered here um, some really useful ways to combine the simulator with ForeFlight uh, that, as we mentioned, can help with training and also help with proficiency. One other area that I'm actually working on is I'm moving up to high performance and complex aircraft. Um, all my training has been in uh, a 172 or in a, a Piper Warrior. The, the gear has been welded on, which is nice, um, but as I haven't had to worry about raising it, but now I'm moving into a situation where it's faster aircraft, um, you know, raising the um, uh, uh, you know, raising the gear and of, of course, dealing with um, a, a fixed speed prop as well. Um, and so the use of the simulator um, and of course, performing all of what we just described, uh, but with a high performance aircraft um, has been a great way of being able to test it. 
Um, and uh, and so that way I can see how much faster, you know, the, the runway comes up towards me, for instance. And when I'm performing the approaches, suddenly I've gone from, you know, uh, like a, a cat A to a cat B approach. And so I'm dealing with a faster ground speed, different rates of descent, that kind of thing. Um, and so it's been very useful for me in preparation for doing more of the, the complex flying um, to go and understand that and uh, and staying ahead of the airplane. Um, and so I, you know, I, I hope to be able to demonstrate that when I come to do the complex test. And that's such a cool example of continuing your progress as a pilot. I think one mantra that every pilot takes upon themselves, and I'm even going to go a step further. I'm going to say every aviator, because I think an aviator is a step up from a pilot. Uh, you know, I just look at that old raggedy guy that was flying the mail in the original days and, and you know, had the leather helmet and everything. So let's be that guy. Um, I think that us leveling up, like you are here with uh with going to more complex high speed high performance aircraft it's just another example of the overarching almost limitless situations and scenarios that you can build with a simulator i mean you name it if you want to practice it these days you can practice it in a simulator if you want to go see what spins are like the spin dynamics in Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 is spot on. It's it's fantastic. If you wanna see what that's like, base to final, where a lot of those accidents happen, not where you would particularly do it yourself, but if you wanna see what that would look like, if you wanna see what an impossible turn would look like, I mean, we can go down the list of a thousand topics and again and again and again, a simulator ends up being a fantastic tool to use. So uh, I don't know, I I've got one right over here uh, behind uh, my airplane where I'm speaking today, I've got, uh, I've, I'm ordering an approved simulator. I'm a believer. So I, I just think that again and again, they just, they pay for themselves. They, they work. Um, even if you can't log it, it's, it's worth logging it in Martin's way where, uh, where you <laughs> do it in the log book. So anyway, I, I, I could stand on the simulator soapbox all day long. Well, Chris, thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. I uh, really appreciate the uh, coverage that we've been able to display and uh, I look forward to continuing this series. There's still way more that we can talk about there. So Absolutely. at that point, what I'd like to do is uh, hand it back to Sam. All right, thanks, Martin. Before we move on to Q&A, just a couple of links here. Uh, if you want to follow Chris's YouTube channel or uh, visit his website, just go to angleofattack.com or youtube.com slash angleofattack. You can also find him uh, using uh, that same name on, on social media. To learn about any of our recent app releases, you can go to foreflight.com slash releases. And if you want to register for more webinars and watch some of our uh, recent ones, visit foreflight.com slash PIC or foreflight.com slash webinars. And finally, if you have any questions at all about Foreflight, just email team at foreflight.com and they'll get back to you quickly with, uh, with a good answer. Thanks everyone for the great questions. We've got a lot of good ones here. Uh, and so I'll just move through some of the ones we've picked out to uh, answer live. So first up here, um, I must have missed the webinar that was mentioned as part one. Is that first webinar available for viewing? Yeah, so um, th this webinar, it, it wasn't really, it wasn't super accurate for me to say it was part two. It is sort of, um, I think it would be helpful to, to watch both of them because they do cover um, some significantly different things. So if you go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash foreflight, um, just search for simulator or you know even just Google uh, foreflight uh, simulator webinar and you should find it. Uh, Chris Palmer is also in that video along with our um, head of, of product design, uh, Ryan McBride in that one. Definitely recommend watching that one as well if you enjoyed this one. Next up here, uh, while flying online, is there a capability to show the other airplanes flying, such as TCAS? And Martin, can you answer that one? Um, sure, yeah. So uh, I just want to clarify that TCAS is um, the Traffic Collision and Avoidance System, which is more of a commercial airliner function. But nevertheless, it, it does use the traffic, and that is something that ForeFly can display. Um, Microsoft Flight Simulator, X-Plane, and Infinite Flight are all able to display traffic in ForeFlight like it was from ADS-B. So you just tap on the traffic layer and uh, and then it will be sourced. And I mentioned that a couple of the connectors uh, will carry that uh, for the Microsoft Flight Simulator 
connectors will carry that ADSB data through. Um, so it is a great thing, especially if you're connecting to like VATSIM or Pilot Edge, where they'll make traffic calls. Um, sometimes in the SIM, it's kind of difficult to see if they're you know even a couple of miles away from you. Whereas uh, you, being able to use that traffic layer to get the positional um, awareness, the situational awareness for the traffic um, makes all the difference. And so yeah, definitely uh, um, it's possible to do that. And uh, you know it could even be live traffic. Um, you know, uh, uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator can display live traffic. Um, and then also, as I say, you know, the, the uh, external systems like Pilot Edge and VATSIM can, can effectively generate the traffic that is going on within the app. Awesome. Thanks, Martin. Moving on to the next question. Um, what about Redbird? Uh, it's a great FAA-approved simulator, easy to connect to via software supplied by Redbird. Martin, can you um, share your thoughts on using Redbird? Absolutely. And I think this feeds back to what we were mentioning. So our focus on this um, webinar has really been more on the software than on the hardware side of things. And Redbird, you know, there is the whole package uh, uh, very much along the lines of what Chris was mentioning early, earlier on that, uh, you know, it's the whole simulator system. So it can include even the table and, and the monitor, the computer. Um, and that is a, uh, an approved training device. Um, and uh, Chris, you know, maybe you just want to uh, sort of repeat the the situation in terms of it being approved and, and what that means for you. Yeah, when the FAA approves a simulator and and for someone like Redbird, a company that um, produces a lot of simulators and sells approved simulators, they have a very long list of criteria that those companies have to meet. And there are things like a seat and an attitude indicator and the, the attitude indicator has to do X, Y, and Z. So it's a very long list of things that have to have to be proven to the FAA to approve that simulator. Um, so the the backbone, from what I understand of Redbird, of the software is prepared, which is uh, made by Lockheed, or rather Lockheed purchased the simulator a while back and they further developed it. So there still is a simulate a flight simulator background there that originated from Microsoft Flight Simulator. But all that to say, um, Redbird kind of has all that in-house. They have their own proprietary software that they connect to for flight. I've used these sims in the past as an instructor to do approved time in a simulator. So I, I can attest to the fact that, yes, the Redbird system, uh, most systems that I'm aware of, if they're, uh, if they're fairly recent, of course, there's old, old Redbird simulators, uh, but they will connect to for flight and it'll be just as transparent as we're talking about with these other home simulators. Great, uh, thanks for the good answer there. Uh, a question we, we got uh, several times throughout the webinar was uh, for actual instructions on how to connect to Microsoft Flight Simulator and, and any of these other ones. Um, so if, if you wanna learn what those steps are, just go to our uh, Four Flight Pilots Guide and go to page, let's see, it starts on page 446. I'm looking at the table of contents right now. So you can access the pilot's guide uh, either online, just just Google for flight pilot's guide and it should come up. Um, or if you uh, are looking, if you have for flight on your device, um, which hopefully most of you do, you can just go to the documents view, go to the for flight drive. And then from there, you can download uh, the pilot's guide to for flight mobile is the name of it. And uh, of course, the documents view does support built in table of contents. So you can just uh, jump to it from there. But that includes all of the basic instructions for all of the flight simulators that we interface with. Right, next question. Uh, what is your recommended setup for the computer and peripherals for Flight Sim 2020 to utilize ForeFlight uh, optimally as a training tool? Uh, Martin, uh, can you shed some light on that? Personally, um, I don't have an approved system. I, you know, I have a, a home PC um, that has, a, you know, a good, good level graphics card in it. And um, I use a Honeycomb Alpha and Bravo controls um, so that I can have, you know, a realistic feel for the controls and especially for the throttles um, and of course with the yoke um, and critically a push to talk button, um, you know, close close at hand um, because, you know, I, I well, this is something that we didn't talk so much about today, but um, will in the future is um, using systems like VATSIM and Pilot Edge, um, you know, helps you to uh, get the radio practice so you're not just um, sort of aviate, navigate, but you can also communicate. Um, and and uh, it certainly helped me a lot during my flight training to be able to speak to a live um, air traffic controller, uh, you know, who's following the procedures and introducing that. So 
um, as I say, I, I think certainly a good PC um, or equivalent uh, machine and uh, the, uh, the good flight controls uh, and, and of course uh, pedals make all the difference there. And, yeah, I, I agree. And I'll just second that, Martin. Uh, you definitely want to take seriously the flight controls of it. You know, the, the days of flying with the keyboard control, controls just don't work. <laughs> so I would definitely recommend, um, you know, getting some nice controls, pedals too, like Martin said. And, and just to re reiterate what Martin said, this is a game at the end of the day. That's how it's coded. So it's using graphics cards. It's using... Uh, the same resources that you typically would with a game. So if you want to get some sort of entry level to mid level gaming PC, that's pretty helpful as a start to get something that can use a simulator. Um, and I know there's other questions. So uh, in terms of which simulator to use, which I think we'll address separately. But if you're using a Mac, then X plane is your best bet because Microsoft Flight Simulator, as you can imagine, only runs on Windows. And unless you're you know, using some sort of um, bridge between a Mac and Windows, which wouldn't be recommended running a sim there anyway, you want to run X-Plane on a Mac. So I just wanted to get that one out of the way too. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the clarification. Um, next question here, uh, do I need to have a formal air quotes there, formal SIM setup, i.e. with a yoke and rudder and all that, in order to log IFR procedures, or can I just run an X-Plane on a computer and log that? So, uh, Chris, th this probably ties into uh, some of your answer right there, but if either one of you It, it does, and it, it's a slightly, we have to dissect that a little bit, because technically you can't, I, I want to make sure people understand you can't log time from a home simulator. So, what Martin talked about a whole lot and what Martin does, what I do in a lot of cases is I use a simulator for my own proficiency and my own gain. It doesn't mean that that actually goes in my my actual logbook as loggable time toward IFR. So just to get that part of the way, let's make sure that we, we define loggable and what that is. Um, and then this, the other part of the question, do you need flight controls? Yes. I think that if you're going to use a simulator at home to actually feel and touch the flight controls and know what they do, it's super helpful. I've noticed students that are brand new to even VFR flying, say as a student pilot, they haven't soloed yet, they haven't gotten their private pilot yet. And just knowing what happens when you pull back or when you turn a little bit, what happens if you turn too much, um, what happens when your speed gets a little too slow, all those cues, although they aren't perfect in a simulator, they still help a lot. And so actually having the tactile feel of the yoke, of the throttle, and what's really big for me in my teaching in the real world, stick and rudder, meaning you need those rudder pedals, uh, having all three is very important. So if I had the choice between picking an entry level uh, gaming PC and having all the flight controls or picking a, a high end or mid level gaming PC and only having a couple of the flight controls, I'm going to pick the former every time where I have all the flight controls. I have a, a gaming PC that's good enough to run the simulator and I get the realism of the whole package uh, rather than just pretty visuals, which um, thankfully enough, X-Plane and Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020, they aren't very resource heavy. So they're actually fantastic on even lower end graphics cards and things. So um you know, definitely get the controls. The controls are number one. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. Yeah, it makes all the difference just to have that that tactile feel. And, you know, as you're turning, as you're um, using the rudders, using the throttles, just to really get it into the um, that muscle memory of, of the things that you're doing. It, you know, obviously there's uh, a, a feedback that um, is usually missing from the normal controls, but the uh, that ability to understand, you know, okay, I'm introducing a turn. Okay, now I'm straightening up. Uh, that kind of thing just make all the difference. Yep. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, next question for for Chris specifically: Do you use Jeppesen charts instead of FAA charts? Uh, I do. So personally, when I'm I'm flying for myself, I use Jeppesen charts. I think I mentioned early on in the video that we presented that uh you know odps for example they're presented much better through jeppesen however an actual approach chart the way it's designed the symbology that jeppesen uses the i don't know just 
it, you can tell they had actual designers design the charts rather than just kind of the government way of doing things. And while those charts are 100% free, I just don't find them as useful. And the investment in the Jeppesen charts is, is by and large totally worth it. So I've used those personally for a really long time. Um, wouldn't use anything else. If a student is using the other charts, I'll often, you know, show them the difference and obviously have them use what they use, but I always encourage them to use Jeppesen. Awesome. Uh, so we have sort of a, a whole grouping of questions here, um, and I'm just going to uh, read one or two of them, and then, um, Chris, you, you can answer them. Um, let's see, we have, so first one, if you were starting new with Sims for training and using ForeFlight, which software would you select? A uh, couple of other ones. Which flight simulator would you recommend as being the best to train IFR? And uh, we, we also have some interesting questions regarding uh, what simulator you would recommend if they're flying different aircraft, like someone is asking about if they're flying a Cirrus, um, what would you recommend? Uh, a 182P, a GFC 500. Um, and so, uh, you know, can, can you provide some recommendations on that? Yeah, absolutely. And And I'll break these into two separate sections. So let's call it VFR versus IFR sims. And then let's call it um, advanced hardware. And Martin, feel free to jump in at any time and just uh, interrupt me if you want to uh, expound on this. But um, I think we alluded to it in the presentation, but I would say that primarily the best simulator right now for VFR flying is Microsoft Flight Sim 2020. The mapping, the terrain, the, the actual neighborhoods uh, down to your house that you can find is very, very accurate. So say that you're going to go and practice a real world cross country and you want to navigate by um, by pilotage and pilotage would be the sort of navigation where you're actually looking at landmarks and navigating from the landmarks. Microsoft Flight Sim 2020 is so accurate. It's just like the real world, basically. I mean, it's 99.9% .9 there. It's amazing. So that would be what I recommend for VFR. When it comes to IFR, most of the approved simulators that are out there are using X-Plane. I find that X-Plane has a more congruent database of IFR uh, mapping procedures and nav aids, all that sort of thing. And they also have pretty good hardware in this. Let me... Let me phrase this correctly. They have pretty good hardware in the simulator. But what I mean by that is that when you're using something like a G1000 in the simulator or a 430 or 530, it acts like that in the simulator. It, it, it all works pretty well. Whereas Microsoft Flight Sim 2020, they have a lot of nice eye candy, but the avionics don't always work correctly. So you can't necessarily trust them. So when it comes to instrument, I've always used X-Plane instead for that because i just find it to be much more accurate now i don't necessarily know what the roadmap is of microsoft flight sim 2020 they have a really good team behind what they're doing and they're constantly updating things so in the future it could get to the place where we see you know that it is a, a great uh, ifr environment and and the clouds and the realism of the weather in flight sim 2020 is is very neat as well so I hope to see that there. I just feel like from the back end technology point of it and the navigation side of it, which is the most important part of IFR, it's not quite there. So that's why I picked X plane. Martin, do you have any mm -hmm. input on that? I I would agree with you. I think um, one of the great things about X plane is the fact that the VORs work correctly. For instance, the um, right. You know the the autopilot works. The um, you know the the whole act of navigation um, just works that much better. Um, and Microsoft has made a fantastic progress um, in the year. Um, you know since they released it, um, they, they, I, I feel like they still have a ways to go. And and you know the roadmap, you know um, definitely up near the top of it has been make sure that the the autopilot works well, make sure the nav works well. So that you know they're definitely working on it. But you know, to the point of, of uh, VFR flying, then you know, Flight Sim 2020 is just um, unparalleled from that perspective. 
Um, I have to say, when I was um, actually starting my instrument, um, I, I ha coming back to your mention about a lower level machine, I actually had a, an old laptop that, that couldn't really pl run the latest games. The graphics card was quite old in it. So I actually ran X-Plane 10 um, in that, but was still able to do good um, IFR practice there and get that out of the way. And then uh, when I um, got a, a more advanced machine, I, I switched to X-Plane 11. Um, and then, you know, suddenly the graphics went up a notch. Um, and then, you know, when uh, Flight Simulator 20, Simulator 2020 came out, then I was able to to start having much better visuals. So, you know, there's been a, a progression there. But certainly, I, I would say that X-Plane is much more solid from that perspective. They, they've been doing it for a lot longer. And, and uh, um, you can you can trust the data. Uh, some uh, I will say just quickly on, on the video where I was showing the GTN, that was actually an add on. Um, uh, there's a, uh, a company uh, um, that, that provides a, um, a, a uses the Garmin trainer uh, for the GTN series um, and then can tie that with X-Plane. Um, and so I was able to, to use that, uh, to, you know, and then that way I could practice much more with, with the real, uh, you know, the closer equivalent to the, the equipment I have in the plane. Great. Um, there was that second question, Sam, that you brought up. Mm -hmm that was about advanced hardware. So someone brought up that they have a 182P and they have a GSC 500, dual G5s, 430. Uh, we all have different airplanes, right? That we fly with different sort of hardware. There are a lot of software depictions of that in the simulators that you can manipulate via the mouse and other things. And of course, that's always very useful. But what I find really neat about simulators recently and in, in say the last two or three years, it's been very recent, is we're getting a lot of hardware companies. So the same sort of companies that would make things like flight controls, but instead of flight controls, they're making GPS interface units. So say you have a 430 in your airplane. Well, you can go buy an interface for the 430 that will display the 430 screen from the simulator, but actually have the tactile feel of the buttons. Um, there are many different companies that do that. Uh, some that come to mind, Virtual Fly, Real Sim Gear, uh, I know, Martin, that you talked about Honeycomb. They make really good uh, controls. So there are companies out there that will go even further with the hardware than just your flight controls. They'll actually you know, have physical units that you can use for, say, the G5s or, or the 430, 530, 650, 750. Um, someone asked about Cirrus as well in here. I think it's Real Sim Gear that has an entire Cirrus setup that you can buy that has the entire suite of avionics from Cirrus, uh, th that's a, a step above. And what I did is I actually created something like that with my simulator. I got some of these different component parts. And uh, there's a company called uh, Stay Level Avionics, and you can get an actual uh, powder-coated metal panel that you can put these different components on or inside, including your instruments. And it gives you an actual panel that can just sit on your desktop you can connect to your controls no matter what those controls are. And it, it it's very affordable for what you get, but ends up just being a really nice and complete package. I actually have a, a YouTube video on me putting my my current sim together, not my approved sim, but my current sim together. And you guys can go and see that. But there's a lot of different options out there. You can go way above and beyond just the software package and get hardware. Uh, but at the end of the day, I will say that even with this advanced stuff, you can kind of get crazy. Even if you have an underpowered laptop like Martin did, and all you can do is, is see the panel and fly in the clouds and use that with some controls, that is just as effective at the end of the day practicing than all the extra eye candy and stuff you'll get from other, some of these other things. So I kind of want to make sure we keep people in their lane of, of using these simulators as a tool for proficiency and uh, I, I kind of like to stay away from the gamer side of it, if you will. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm getting too old and crotchety. I just <laughs> I like the idea of, of using it for work now. I don't know. Maybe I should be a little bit more fun about it. Awesome. Thanks, y'all. Um, so we're 
almost 30 minutes uh, over time here, so I'm just going to do one more question. Uh, before I do, just for everyone who's stuck around for the Q&A, thanks for, for sticking around. Um, if you have a, an outstanding question, maybe you've uh, determined by now that it's probably not going to be answered. Uh, this is what I meant when I said submit your questions early, because <laughs> if you wait until the very end, they're probably not going to get, get answered. But if you do still have an outstanding question, please email team at forfight.com. Um, because we we definitely want to answer it, uh, but we're just a little bit overwhelmed with how many came in uh, right at the end. So here's the very last question. Um, it's a pretty long one, so I'll just take a deep breath. Uh, <laughs> I am a student pilot and Forfly user in real life, and I fly X Plane 11 and Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 in standalone mode. I am in the process of getting set up in VATSIM and Pilot Edge, but have not yet actually flown in either of these virtual worlds. So I'm ignorant in many ways as to how they work. I track uh, real world traffic all the time in ForeFlight. When you talk about being able to see ForeFlight traffic when flying in the simulator, is that real world traffic imported into the sim world or is it the traffic of other sim pilots flying in those virtual worlds, uh, either VATSIM or Pilot Edge, if that makes any sense. Martin, do you, do you wanna address that? Absolutely. Um, so I'm talking about what the simulator is generating or sending out. And by generating, <clears throat> it depends on the simulator. Like for instance, there's a live traffic mode within Flight Simulator 2020. And so then what it will do is it will use that live feed and then be able to send that out to ForeFlight. So when you turn the traffic layer on, it's not using the like the internet traffic source, it's using the simulator source. And that actually works the same way with VATSIM and Pilot Edge. And uh, Xplane itself can generate kind of artificial traffic, but in all cases, um, it's, it's displaying the uh, the flight simulator traffic, not the uh, the internet traffic. So, you know, if you turned and headed towards it, for instance, you would actually be able to see that traffic because it is, you know, the simulator knows about it. So that's a, a critical distinction there. Um, and uh, and one to bear in mind because you know especially when and congratulations on being a student pilot by the way and I look forward to hearing more about how things go for you because um, as I say when I um, first got started especially I was taking off from a, a Charlie uh, from Austin and uh, I needed to get used to uh, air traffic control for instance and so Pilot Edge really helped me even though I couldn't fly from Austin because they don't cover that region um, you know I could practice at other Charlies in California and the phraseology was the same and they were very strict on that um, and so they helped me to learn how to get clearance how to taxi how to take off how to depart the area how to come in for a final approach that kind of thing um, and I can't recommend it enough it was it was fantastic All right, perfect. Thanks, Martin. Um, with that, I think we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Um, once again, thank you, Martin. Thank you, Chris, for a really great informative webinar. Um, definitely check out uh, Chris's YouTube channel if you haven't already, uh, youtube.com slash angle of attack. He's got a lot of really great content there, uh, as, as you probably heard. So go check that out. Um, if you want to watch a recording of this or share it with others, um, you can just pay attention to our YouTube channel over the next day or go visit forflight.com slash PIC. And of course, uh, if you want answers to any kind of question, whether it's a question related to flight simulators, uh, related to ForeFlight, or um, just even kind of a general aviation question, we do sometimes field those. So uh, email team at forflight.com and our pilot support team will get you taken care of. So thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you on the next webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone.